Today we're talking about the dawn of religion and how it all began. And we're talking about it in the context of Julian Jaynes' theory of the bicameral mind. Now, bicameral means two-chambered, all right? And we've been talking a lot about the left and right hemispheres of the brain. So today, the left brain, consciously located area, is the dominant hemisphere of the brain, all right? For most uh, individuals, the left hemisphere is the dominant hemisphere of the brain. Our left conscious hemisphere is the dominant hemisphere. However, in the past, Julian Jaynes posits that that wasn't the case. He says that it was in fact the right hemisphere that was the dominant hemisphere of the brain and that that was the executive function, that it served as the command giver. And basically what this means is that humans in ancient times weren't conscious like we are conscious today. Instead, they were constantly directed not by self-awareness, but by auditory hallucinations. So when they would go along about their day, mostly unconscious, and when they needed to make a choice or decision, they would hear an auditory hallucination that would give them a command telling them what to do. And this was interpreted as the voices of the gods. So in a nutshell, what this means is that early humanity wasn't conscious in a self-aware way, but was almost in a state of constant hallucination, almost like a constant psychedelic or constant dreamlike state. And this is because, according to Jaynes, the right hemisphere was the dominant hemisphere, and it was only later on that the left hemisphere became dominant, and that is when self-awareness began to take over, we developed an analog eye, we developed the ability to you know, really project into the future and weigh out different scenarios, and we began to make choices for ourselves rather than relying on the voices of the gods. So, this is a really quick synopsis, really quick in a nutshell version of what the bicameral mind theory is, but we are going to continue looking at this right now. And we're going to be taking a look at excerpts from The Holographic Soul by Mike Hockney. And if you enjoy that work, I highly recommend it. It is an excellent book. Links to where you can read it will be in the description of this video. So, human beings were originally bicameral, bicameral, meaning largely unconscious. They were subject to hallucinations, both visual and auditory. They inhabited something akin to a waking dream world. So if you can imagine early humanity didn't exist in the consciousness that we understand today, that they constantly had uh, visual and auditory hallucinations. It was sort of like this waking dream state or this constant tripping sort of state. And this way of, and, and what I want you guys to realize is that people today are at vastly different levels of consciousness. And many people still are in that bicameral state. People will still experience visions or see, you know, hallucinations, whether, you know, they see Jesus or they feel the Holy Spirit or any of these things. Um, this is sort of a throwback to, or, or, or sort of shards of the bicameral mind re-emerging where the right hemisphere unconscious is leaking into left brain consciousness. So this is how we can explain, you know, those, uh, these, these, these religious experiences that many people have. Religious experiences, spiritual experiences, etc. And what we also have to realize 
is that bicameralism is basically what happened with bicameralism is that people relied on these auditory hallucinations to make decisions. These voices commanded them and told them and controlled them on what decisions to make. However, as consciousness evolved and the left brain began to dominate, those voices became quieter and quieter and quieter and eventually went away. And so guess what happened? Humanity suddenly didn't know how to make decisions for themselves. They were still learning about self-awareness and choice. So how do you make a decision? You used to have a voice of a god or something that told you what to do. Well, this is where they started relying on things like divinatory systems, things like uh, omens to make decisions for them. So for example, if they had to make a choice and they didn't have a voice of a god telling them what to do, well, what would they do? Well, they would do some sort of divinatory system. They would, you know, uh, cast lots, you know, and cast bones. And if the bones fell in a certain way, oh, well, the bones fell in this pattern, so the gods must want me to do this certain thing. Or, you know, when they would look at the entrails of animals to see, oh, oh, what, what are the gods telling me that I should do? Or they began to, you know, look at omens, like, oh, that tree branch broke. That must be a sign that I need to make this decision in my life. So you see when the voices of the gods started to go away, humanity, rather than simply making choices for themselves, tried to figure out what the gods wanted them to do by these divinatory systems or looking for signs, looking for omens, etc. And we have to be very, very careful because this aversion to making decisions still exists today. People don't want to have the weight of deciding for themselves. And so they look to someone or something, excuse me, someone or something else. They look to religion. They look to a book, what God tells them they should do, what a preacher tells them they should do. And this is why we also have to be really careful with things like horoscopes and astrology and tarot cards. I've talked about how tarot cards can be useful before as a glimpse into your psyche using psychological methods. But, if pe but some people use it on what decisions they should make. Oh, I don't, what should I do today? Oh man, I don't know. Let me check my horoscope. Oh, what should I do? What, you know, what decision should I make? Oh man, let me pull these cards. What decision should I make? Oh, let me, let me pray. Let me uh, talk to my pastor. Let me read the Bible. And so we have to be very, very careful because remember, our goal is apotheosis. And as gods, we need to be in command of ourselves, our own consciousness, and our own decisions. And this means taking the responsibility for choosing our own actions and not having someone or something be in control of what we do. That is a throwback to that bicameral consciousness. Most people want, think they want to maximize their consciousness. They don't. Most people are afraid of consciousness. A lot of people want freedom, say they want freedom, they're not. A lot of people are afraid of freedom. Most people want to be told what to do. And we can see this in leaders um, as well. Just look at, you know, someone like Donald Trump. People would just do and go with what the commanding voice of the God told them to do. And again, this is a throwback to bicameralism. People don't want to think for themselves. People don't want to make choices for themselves. So they will look to a person, an authority figure, a priest, a pope. They will look to divinatory systems. Anything other than thinking for themselves. 
So, remember, in Hyperianism, it's incredibly important to become a free autonomous thinker where you're not afraid to make your own, own decisions, where you're not afraid to think for yourself. That's what it's all about. It's about becoming a free autonomous thinker. And that doesn't mean that there can't be leadership or something like that. But what it means is if the leader is telling you to do something that's wrong, don't do it just because an authority figure tells you to do it. Question it. So it's about using logic and reason to be able to filter and examine everything and think for yourself and go with the best thing, the best choice for your personal evolution and our collective evolution. So that doesn't mean, you know, don't work with a community, don't work with a collective. You absolutely should work with a community and you should work with a collective. But it means doing it in a way where you're guided by your self-awareness and your logic and your reason rather than just some sort of blind faith. But anyway, this is why talking about bicameralism is important. Because we can see in this theory by James, uh, as he posits it, why people began to turn to things such as religion, to things such as holy books, and everything else. Because they were trying to establish that connection back to the right hemisphere of the brain that was lost. Now, as Hyperians, we want to regain that connection to the right hemisphere of the brain because that's the frequency domain, that's the source. But we want to do it while retaining our left hemisphere functions as well. So do you see how, it, you know, in early times it was, it was right brain domination and then the right brain receded, and now there's a dominant dominance by the left brain. What we want to do is bring the right brain back, but not get rid of the left, retain the left while bringing the right, and having them work together, integrated and synchronized to become whole. So while in the past it was right brain dominance, and today it's left brain dominance, we want to, as Hyperians, as new humanity, don't, we want synchronization. We want integra integration. We want wholeness and we want unity. So, human beings were originally bicameral. They were subject to hallucinations, both visual and auditory. They inhabited something akin to a waking dream world. Dreams for the ancients were profoundly different from modern dreams, since there was much less of a boundary between waking and dreaming. Rather than a sharp waking-sleeping dichotomy, as in the present day, there was a kind of continuous mental state covering waking and sleeping. Above all, the dead didn't fully die. Even when their physical bodies were gone, they still retained a mental presence. So there wasn't a firm delineation between waking and sleeping, or the waking world and the dream world. You constantly had these, uh, the dream world leaking into the waking world. Again, it's like being in a constant state of hallucination, a constant tripping state. The ancients were more or less intuitive feeling types. They believed that spirits were everywhere, animism. This is exactly what you would expect from people with a much closer link to the integrated holistic unconscious domain. Early humans had a non-local mentality. The world and the universe seemed much more of a oneness they had a holographic approach to reality and were immersed in the frequency domain. 
And you can even see in how some of the earliest religions, they talk a lot about, you know, the, the unity and the wholeness and the oneness. Paranormal, non-local phenomena, are to intuitive minds what normal local phenomena are to sensing types. The paranormal has a similar relationship to the normal as metaphysics does to physics. That is, it's what comes after it. The paranormal, metaphysics, and religion all have the same non-local root. Hence, all are equally idiotic to people locked into localism, that is, scientists. Evolution brought about a remarkable change in humanity. The rise of left brain consciousness was, mathematically, a switch from minds designed for frequency domain wave functions to minds geared up for inverse Fourier transforms, space-time representations of frequency functions, and forward Fourier transforms converting uh, converting space-time oh, I'm sorry converting space-time functions back into frequency functions. There was an evolution from non-localism to localism. So basically, um, for those who aren't too familiar or haven't seen the past videos, there is the frequency domain and there is the space-time domain. Loosely and roughly speaking, the right brain is associated with the frequency domain. The left brain is associated with uh, the space-time domain which means the left brain is associated with linear local functions, space-time representations, space-time functions, i.e. the physical world, what you can sense, the senses. The right brain is connected to the frequency domain, the source, the singularity. If we're talking about a video game metaphor, the left brain is associated with the video game world, the right brain is associated with the underlying code. So, essentially, and again, the right brain is associated with dreams, the unconscious, the left brain is associated with the waking world, the conscious. And so early humanity was right brain dominated, according to Julian Jaynes' theory, meaning that the left brain, you know, allowed one to get around in the world, but the dreamlike portion of the mind was the one that was controlling and giving commands. And so, again, since the right brain portion was more in control, you were, there was not a distinct boundary between waking and sleeping. And you can get sort of this idea of when you're asleep and dreaming when you're asleep and dreaming you're not really giving much thought to you're not really critically examining what's going on in your dream you're just going along with the dream narrative you're going about and doing things but you're not really questioning it you're just going along with the dream narrative so early humanity was sort of in that very much dreamlike state where that dreamy function of the brain, which is associated with frequency functions and unity and non-locality, was uh, the executive function and in control. Evolution brought about a remarkable change in humanity. The rise of left brain consciousness was mathematically, a switch from minds designed for frequency domain functions to minds geared up for inverse Fourier transforms. Okay? So, in other words, the dominance switched from a mind that was more plugged into that dreamy aspect to minds that were more associated with the world of space and time. So you went from this mental dreamlike dominance 
to to being more dominated by the physical and what's around you. And this change had the most extraordinary effect. The ancients had something approaching a collective consciousness. In fact, they were extremely like ants in ant colonies. It would be fascinating to analyze actual ant colonies and determine whether it's not so much pheromones, a local phenomena that guides their behavior, but rather the fact that they all operate according to frequency mathematics, a non-local phenomena, and are therefore extremely closely linked mentally. Note how scientists always have to find a local explanation since their meta paradigm does not accommodate non-local effects. So. The idea here is that early humanity also behaved a lot more collectively, a lot more akin to, say, like an ant colony, a lot more like a sort of a hive mind mentality. And again, you can see this sort of throwback in when throngs of individuals look like, again, look at, look at, um, Trump, again, Trump is always a really good example. Look at, for example, people just behaving as sort of a, a in, in masses and being directed en masse. But as soon as human brains became dominated by a local rather than non-local mode, the age of oracles and heroes directed by the gods came to an up, abrupt end humans became radically less communitarian. The ancients were much more interested in life-giving, nurturing goddesses as their divinities. As communities began to vanish, selfish, violent, aggressive, masculine war gods came to the fore, and humanity switched from a goddess matriarchy to a god patriarchy. So, switching from sort of community and collectivity to war, division, destruction, individualism. Animism, which involved many spirits and divinities, often emphasizing the power of females, gave way to monotheism, a single hyper-masculine dominant god, the supreme alpha male. People under the thrall of extreme localism are prone to greed, selfishness, hatred, intolerance, racism, xenophobia, nationalism, and so on. People such as the anarcho-capitalist libertarians of America have a hatred of all non-local phenomena, amongst which can be classed as government and the state and society. They want to inhabit a tiny local patch over which they have complete control, with which no one else interferes and forgets the rest of the world. Localism gives rise to the scientific mind that looked at the world reductively, chopping it into endless localized parts. The scientific mind has no need of God, of course. Empiricism and materialism are intrinsically localist ideologies. The more left-brained that you become, in either thinking or sensing terms or both, the more you are cut off from the non-local noumenal reality. In fact, localism is the origin of the phenomena noumena dichotomy. At the dawn of life on Earth, life mentally inhabited the non-local frequency domain outside space and time. This was the only reality. Then, when it became possible to perform inverse Fourier transforms, a new domain emerged, the local phenomenal domain of space-time. Two domains now existed, local and non-local. And this is the whole idea here, is that local versus non-local left brain versus right brain, the fight between the two is at the root of all of our problems. And remember, local versus non-local 
if you're ever wondering what the difference is, the, a real good way of thinking about it is the video game world versus the code. Local means location dependent. Non-local is non-location dependent. The physical world is location dependent. There are th certain things, you know, there, there, there is a cup three feet away from me. You see that involves a location, a physical location. Non-local information, there, there is no space-time location. It's everywhere at once. And again, a way to, to think about this is the video game world. In a video game world, the video game world can be thought of as being local. There are video game trees a certain you know video game distance away. But the code is non-local. The code is everywhere. There isn't some code over there and some code over there and some code up there and some code down there and oh I have to walk over here to get to this. No, the code the code is everywhere. So you have the left brain, which is associated with localism, which is associated with space and time, which is associated with the senses, which is associated with the holos. And then you have the right brain, which is associated with frequency functions, which is non-local, which is the unconscious, which is the uh, you know frequency basis of existence. And so you have you have um, religion, which is a right brain non-local phenomena, and then you have science which is a left brain local phenomena. But really what we need is not one or the other, but we need both. You see religion, mainstream religion become, becomes so insane that it leads to all manner of problems. Science becomes so locked into the sensory world that it completely discounts a mental domain, a metaphysical domain, a mathematical domain, and rejects the most fundamental and foundational aspect of existence, the necessary aspect of existence that makes all of contingent temporal spatial reality possible. We rest upon a necessary, eternal, analytic reality. And science denies that. And so you see this fight between localism and non-localism, physics and metaphysics, space, time, and frequency. But there, what we as Hyperians want to do is become integrated and whole and unified. With logic and reason, of course, always being the guiding light, guiding the way, so nothing gets out of hand. But it's all about integrating and becoming whole. That is the way to apotheosis. That is the way to becoming God. That is the way to actualizing the absolute. This is why the mirror self is so important. So make sure you take a look at the mirror self in, in, on a, in inner star actualization. So, in truth, there is only one domain, the mental domain outside space and time. But the phenomenal domain of space has sprung from it thanks to in inverse Fourier transform processing, which can represent frequency func functions in an entirely different way as space-time functions. So, you basically have the frequency domain the domain of frequency, the domain of mind. But those frequency functions, that domain of mind, can be representa represented, represented as space-time functions via the Fourier transform. So we have mind. We, reality is a domain of mind. But we can represent mind via a Fourier transform. We can represent frequency functions as a space-time representation. And again, think about the relationship between 
in, in dreams. Your dream world, the dream chair, the dream cup, the dream castle, is a physical representation of your mind. The dream cup, the dream chair, the, the dream castle, they're not actually physical. They're mental. But it's a space-time visual representation of your mind. It's your mind othered. So same thing with this reality. Everything is mental. Everything is frequency. But via the Fourier transform, we can have space-time representations of frequency. And so we can experience a local universe based on non-local functions. Just like we can have a video game world based on the non-local code. You remove the code, the video game world vanishes because the video game world is dependent upon the code. Just like in a dream world, you remove the dreamer, the dream vanishes because the dream is dependent on the mind of the dreamer. This world, the holos, the so-called physical world, if you remove us, the minds, the physical world vanishes because the physical world is dependent on us as monads, as minds, and is dependent on the frequency functions that we provide because we are the source of those frequency functions as eternal minds that exist outside space and time in the frequency domain of the source. So, our right brain, home of the unconscious, home of frequency functions, home of non-local phenomena. And, and remember, it's not actually in the right brain. I'm, I'm sure you guys know this. I'm sure you guys know this. But if, if there's anyone new. But the right brain is what allows us to access, gives us access to that domain. It's associated with that domain. So our right brain, home of the unconscious, is attuned to the non-local universe, the frequency domain, and operates according to frequency functions. Our left brain, home of consciousness, is attuned to the local universe, everything around you right now, and to space and time functions. Our weird and wonderful minds and all the baffling mysteries that beset the human condition are all caused by two different mathematical ways of representing information. Is it not wondrous? We now have an exact mathematical means to unlock the secrets of the universe. So all the arguments that we have, all the conflict that we have, is caused by this misunderstanding that mathematical information can be represented in two different ways. Non-locally as frequency functions or locally as space-time functions. And they seem as different as they could possibly be. Again, think about a video game world and the code. The video game world and the code seem completely different from each other. So frequency functions and space-time functions seem completely different. But in fact, they're just two, they're, they're, it's just mathematically two different ways of representing information. And this is why scientists can't understand the religious and the religious can't understand the scientists because scientists are left brain, local space time represented, uh, you know, tuned into that those functions, and then the religious are turned into the frequency, non-local functions. And so what has to be like is, no, 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 no. Here, what we need to do is not have one or the other. We need to integrate the two, see that they are just two sides of the same coin and see how we can get them to work together. And that, when I say, and, and what I mean by that is, is by going, okay, guys, you guys who are into mainstream religion, all right, you've gone way off the deep end here. 
uh, we need to reel this all back because this has gone way out of control. You've allowed this dreamlike state, this dreamlike mentality to get you way off track. And then we need to go over to the, uh, the, the scientific way and go, look, you guys have made great advancements in the physical world, but there's a lot more to reality than the physical world. And you're missing the most important part, the necessary foundational ground of existence, the idea, the mental reality, the frequency domain that underpins and allows all of contingent temporal spatial reality to exist in the first place. So what we need is the guiding light of logic and reason to get the two halves, the two hemispheres, the two functions, the two ways of looking at, at the world as not being diametrically opposed, but rather dialectically synthesized. And that's the problem. The left and the right, the local and the non-local, are not diametrically opposed. They need to be dialectically synthesized, Opposite, opposites unified into one. That's what the dialectic is all about. Opposites unified into one. Things that seem opposed actually unified into a third thing that's higher. The unity of the two into a higher thing. So the scientific view based solely on localism is false. The scientific view that just looks at the space-time representations. That view is false. The real universe is one of endless frequencies. The real universe isn't the video game world, it's the code. Doesn't mean the, the world's not important. It's very important. And it's a lot of fun. It's where we can create anything we want and do whatever we want. But it's not the real world. The real world's the code, and by learning the code, we can make this wor the game world into whatever we want. We can create new Terra instead of the hell that we have now. So our left brains convert these, the frequencies, into space-time representations. When we go to sleep and dream, our left brain transfers processing to the right brain and we ret return to something like the mode of existence enjoyed by our ancestors. Space, time, and causality fall apart. So the, the dreamlike world is a similar state to that bicameral state. It's not exactly the same, but, but it's similar. And this is why, you know, when people have religious experiences, they're very dreamlike because that's exactly what's happening. You're tapping into the right brain unconscious. And this is why when people, you know, uh, you know, see angels or, or anything like this, it's the right brain unconscious leaking into left brain consciousness. Julian James' brilliant theory of bicameralism is one of the most important intellectual breakthroughs of all time. Like many of the uh, like many of the best ideas, it's largely ignored. The localist paradigm that dominates science, mathematics, and psychology can't take seriously non-local hallucinated voices. However, James's theory can be put on the solidest ground by making it strictly mathematical. James understood that the bicameral, two-hemisphere nature of the brain is the brain's most significant feature. This is the key to human existence. The two hemispheres allow two views of reality to be accessed at once. The right brain allows a frequency representation of reality and is about non-localism, and the left brain allows a space and time representation and is about localism. The right brain is about synthesis, holism, integration, interconnectedness, and the whole universe. And the left brain is about analysis, individuation, reductiveness, separation, and the partial universe. All of the mysteries of the human condition are answered by the simple twin mathematical representation of reality by way of Fourier mathematics. And I've given this example so many times, but I'll give it just one more time real quick because I think it's so helpful and I, don't, and I want people to remember. The non-local and local 
and left brain versus right brain is a lot like the difference between a person standing on a street in the city and another person in an airplane looking over and seeing the entire city all at once. So the person on the ground, on the street, they're like the left brain perspective and they're getting a lot of detail. They're seeing a lot of details. They're seeing, you know, people crossing the streets, cars going, they can read the individual street signs. They're getting a lot of little details. But they can't see the big picture. They can't see the city all at once. Now the person in the plane high above the city can see the entire city all at once, but they're missing a lot of little details. And the idea here is that this is similar, you know, this is a metaphor, an analogy to understanding the perspectives of left brain and right brain or space-time functions versus frequency functions. And you don't want to get rid of one or the other, you want them to work together. You want the person on the ground to have a radio communication with the person in the plane so the person in the plane can tell the person on the ground what's happening in the whole city and the person on the ground can give them details about what's happening from street view. Right, that's another you know good way to look at it. Think about like Google Maps, where you can look down on Google Maps and see the entire map, or then you can go down into Street View. The top-down Google Map view, that's the frequency domain. Street View, that's like being in space-time representation mode. That's like being in left left brain mode. And you want them to work together. You don't want one or the other. You can see that uh, they each have their uses. Sometimes street mode is useful, sometimes the map mode is useful. useful. But you don't want to deny one or the other. And again, this isn't a perfect analogy, but this is a metaphorical way to understand the difference sort of between frequency functions and space-time representations. Frequency functions are all about non-locality, everything all at once. Space-time functions are about you know, you have to, uh, dependent on sequential, linear, and, you know, events that are localized around you. And right now, you know, we, we are left brain dominated. And so we're all in street view. When you have, when you have intuitions, you're getting little pieces of, of, of the map view, everything all at once. So when you have intuitions, grand realizations, like suddenly you just like realize, oh wow, all of reality is connected or etc. Those are your you know pieces and portions and glimpses of the right brain frequency unconscious associations. But you're getting just pieces of it, and you and and it's non-local information, so it has to be ordered by logic and reason, or else you're going to start going to cra going into crazy town, like people who subscribe to New Age religions and mysticism and stuff like that. They haven't properly examined and ordered their intuitions based on logic and reason. But hopefully, that gives you a little bit of a good way to grasp the difference. And one of these days, we're going to do a deep dive into Fourier mathematics and really get into the mathematics of all this. So you can really see what frequency functions are and how frequency functions relate to, you know, space-time functions. We'll take a look at Dirac delta spikes and um, uh, and and the Fourier transform of these things and, and really dive into the mathematics. But to understand it simplistically, you know, this, this is the issue. And what we want to do is have a well-integrated mind that makes use of both and doesn't deny one or the other because everyone today denies one or the other. You have scientific materialists deny the, you know, the, the frequency function unconscious and they're all about left brain holos space-time representations. And then you have, you know, religious mystical systems that are all about, oh no, we should deny the body and go to nirvana and, and, and they completely deny the, lo the local. So everyone's all about one or the other. This is a fractured world. This is because this is a fractured people. We won't have a whole world and we won't have a united world until we have a whole and united people. So that's why our goal is to create a new humanity and thus a new earth. And to model a new humanity on, psych on a psyche.
or a model new world on a psyche. The world must be constructed according to, this, to a psyche, according to a mind. Because it is made up of nodes. It is made up of minds. So as above, so below, we must structure the world meritocratically, teleologically, and dialectically based on a mind and a psyche. And make sure that the world has institutions that accommodate for a world ego, a world shadow, a world mirror, and institutions that function as those psyche, psychic, psychic meaning psyche, nothing woo-woo about it, psychic functions. So our soul, we are souls, we are minds, we are monads. Our soul belongs to the frequency domain outside of space and time and is accessed by our unconscious located in the right hemisphere. Our body belongs to the domain inside space and time and is accessed by our conscious located in the left hemisphere. The Jungian ego belongs to left hemisphere and the Jungian self to the right hemisphere. To understand reality, there are two things to bear in mind. One, what reality ultimately is, and two, how humans interact with reality. Reality is an endless ocean of energy. Energy is ontological numbers, which are sinusoidal waves. And this energy or originates in endless monads, souls, which are eternal, autonomous, mathematical functions that can originate their, or their own mathematical functions, thoughts, behaviors, actions, which is exactly why they are able to exhibit free will. That is, actions not determined by others. Remember, what is the definition of free will? To be self-determined. Self-determination, that is free will. And monads are self-determining deterministic systems. So, you know, we can easily define what free will is. What is free will? Self-determination. What are monads? Self-determining deterministic systems. Hence, monads are free. Ultimate reality is outside space and time. It's non-local. Everything exists at a single point, the singularity. The unconscious right hemisphere is attuned to true, true reality, the code, the frequency domain. Our left hemisphere has evolved a means via inverse Fourier transforms to depict frequency functions the code as space-time functions the physical world the game world so basically what, what what actually exists the code but we have evolved to represent the code as physical reality we have evolved to represent the code as the game world and this converts non-local noumenal reality into a local phenomenal depiction of reality, the illusion of Maya. The phenomenal domain, what we call in Hyperionism the holos, is the one studied by science, which is all about localism. It's the illusion. I mean, it's not truly illusional in that it's really there, but it's an illusion in that it has no independent existence. It depends on the frequency functions. It depends on mind or its existence. We have evolved a brain that gives us two views of reality at once via its two hemispheres. That's why we have two hemispheres. We perform Fourier transforms with the right brain, space-time to frequency, and inverse Fourier transforms with the left brain, frequency to space-time. 
and the corpus callosum, uh, callosum, linking the two hemispheres, shuttles information between them. What could be more elegant, effective, and efficient? To be more precise, the right hemisphere deals with frequency-frequency functions and space-time frequency Fourier transforms, while the left hemisphere deals with space-time-space-time functions and frequency-space-time inverse Fourier transforms. The right hemisphere passes frequency information to the left hemisphere con for conversion into space-time data, and the left hemisphere passes space-time data to the right hemisphere for conversion into frequency information. It might alternatively be argued that the left hemisphere does both the inverse and Fourier, uh, forward Fourier transforms. That is, it takes frequency information from the right and converts it into space-time information and also does the reverse and passes frequency information to the right. A case could be advanced that both hemispheres have exactly the same core mathematical abilities, but they learn to specialize in either space-time or frequency processing depending on hemispheric dominance. And that's an important thing to um, point out here is that we talk that we're talking um, very in in very very extreme ways, such as the left hemisphere is about this and the right hemisphere is about this. But remember, I said in one of my previous videos that we're really simplifying things down to um, make it easy to discuss. But really, the most likely case is, is that both hemispheres are involved in both ways of processing information, but one is more heavily associated with one than the other. Because all, all pro most processes involve both right and left hemispheres of the brain. But in talking in this extreme way, it allows us to get a picture of what's going on. So that's impo an important thing to remember that when, whenever we're talking about this, uh, we're talking about this in a, simpl in, a, in a very simplified way. So nature which is mathematics, has given us the opportunity to inhabit two domains at once, local and non-local, phenomenal and noumenal, conscious and unconscious. In the local, we are separate. In the non-local, we are connected. We are the one and the many. Remember, this is why I say always cultivate the three Hyperion perspectives, avatar, monadic, and absolute. This is the key. This is the key to everything. Understand these three perspectives. We are the one and the many. We are the absolute. We are the one that has particularized itself into many monads that then individually experience localized existence in avatars in space and time in separate bodies so we have this individual separate existence in avatar then a monadic particularized existence and an absolute unified existence all existing simultaneously at the same time so remember this is the key always 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 strive to have and understand these three perspectives and I know it's difficult but that's what it's all about it's gonna take time it's gonna take a lot of time but that's okay just always work on this but a great problem has arisen our hemispheres which ought to be balanced have become asymmetric the left brain is dominant in most people. The right brain works reasonably well only in intuitives who are enormously outnumbered by sensing types. In our bicameral past, where religion originated, the right brain was dominant and we were linked to the universe. Our consciousness was, however, meager. So in the past, we had a great link to the universe but we were hardly self-aware at all. Now, we have a strong consciousness, but we have lost our link to the universe. 
which is why scientists are atheists. Only intuitives retain a non-local mentality. But we don't want, like many New Agers and mystics, to destroy ego self-awareness and revert back to our past. No, that's not what it's about. It's about retaining our ego, retaining our consciousness, and strengthening our ego and strengthening our consciousness while bringing back our connection to the unconscious and integrating the two. So remember, we are not New Agers, we are not mystics, we are the furthest thing from that. Humanity was once too right-brained, yet now it's too left-brained. During the transition phase, humanity must have passed through an extraordinary pe period where human perception of space and time kept changing as we moved away from a mentality outside space and time to one firmly rooted in space and time. So the thesis, we have old humanity, which was right brain dominance, right brain was the master, and left brain was the slave, bicameral mentality. Now today, current humanity is the antithesis. They are left brain dominated, where the left brain is the master, the right brain is the slave, and this is consciousness mode. The synthesis is new humanity. This is Hyperionism, new humanity, which is hemispheric balance, hemispheric integration, left brain and right brain as equal partners, integration of the ego and the higher self, super consciousness. We can become divine only if we equalize our hemispheres in terms of their respective dominance. Only if we end the master-slave system of our own brains, the master-slave dialectic must come to an end within our heads before it can come to an end in the world. Our right brain might... So, and that's what I really want to emphasize here, and I think that's a really important part. The master-slave dialectic must come to an end within our heads before it can come to an end in the world. And if you aren't familiar with the master-slave dialectic, uh, that's a very important Hegelian concept that we're not going to get into right now because it's very in-depth, but at some point I'll do a video on it, we'll do a discussion on it. But this idea that the conflict in our own heads must come to an end before a conflict in the world at whole, the world at large can come to an end, is crucial, is key. And this is why we will create a new humanity and a new earth. And this is why people go, oh, well, how are you going to build new Terra? And people don't understand that we are building new Terra by building a new humanity. We are building new Terra by spreading this information. Because as humanity evolves, as humans become Hyperion, the world at large evolves because we are all nodes in the world which acts as a mind. So this is why it is so important for you to work on balancing the left and right hemispheric functions of the brain guided by logic and reason in yourselves and also going out and spreading this information by talking to people, telling people about this, sharing and sharing this information on Facebook. That's why I always emphasize, you know, sharing, hitting the like button, all that. It's not for popularity or some shit. If I wanted to do popularity, I wouldn't be talking about mathematics. If I wanted to go a popular route, I would be a gamer channel or something. This is about spreading information so that we can institute world change. And world change begins in individuals. So while old humanity was right brain dominated, humanity today, it has lost its link to the universe and is now firmly entrenched in left brain localism. But now, as a new synthesized humanity, we are well integrated in that we bring back our connection to the source 
through our intuition and through our reason. Intuition and reason allows us our connection to the source. One in sort of an unmediated direct way and, and another through an analytic uh, more linear way. But in either case, we retain our connection. We bring back our connection to the source. But we don't deny our left brain consciousness. We also have a strong and powerful ego. Remember, the ego and the higher self are not at odds. They need to be integrated and synthesized and united and helping each other. Just like, you know, the Google map view versus the street view. They're not at odds. They both have functions. They both have a place. The person in the plane and the person on the street. Both need to be communicating with each other and helping each other to make ultimate progress. This is the way to apotheosis. This is the way to godhood. Us as monads, our higher selves, our true selves, generated ego consciousness to be our emissaries, to be our gateways into the physical world. So don't destroy that gateway. Open that gateway. Use your local left hemispheric functions to allow yourself, your higher self, to become fully actualized through the power of consciousness and the ego and self-awareness and the I. So always remember, it's not one or the other. It's about integrating both together. And as we, as Hyperians, become united, the world itself will become united. And we will create new Terra, and we will build new Terra to reflect a psyche. And we will create a meritocratic, teleological, dialectical new world with institutions created worldwide that reflect the construction of a psyche, of a mind. That way we will finally have a world that instead of being constructed like a dead capitalist corporate machine is constructed as it truly is, a living mind.